Let's have a look at Lickenhaus 007 today. Luckily, Lickenhaus provided us with lots of detailed pictures of the assembly of the car and there's a lot to talk about. In this first part, we will have a closer look at aerodynamics. One thing we shouldn't forget is that Lickenhaus is a small private team that developed the whole car, except engine and gearbox, by themselves. We see a front with less air intakes compared to the Toyota and it looks like it has a single upper element with no additional flaps like the Bicolas. But Lickenhaus has no hybrid system, just as the Bicolas, but for that it has a pretty fat nose. At the very beginning of the project, Lickenhaus said they wanted to use a hybrid system, but decided not to use one later on. The fat nose might still be there because they developed the crest structure already, and that is a lot of work to change afterwards for a small team like them. We can see a front wing with raised center section to avoid stalling under braking, and we can also see flaps, but their width is limited due to the wider nose. There are outlets on the front bodywork to release air off the front of the car. At the side we can see small flicks. They create some downforce and longitudinal vortices along the front wheels to suck air out of the wheel arches. Interesting is the center seating position. The rear wing has a lowered output flap trailing edge, but the main plane leading edge is the same across the span. This means they run a reduced camber output, which creates less pressure difference close to the end plate, which means a weaker tip vortex and less induced drag. Also, the shorter outboard cord means less interference between the boundary layer of the wing's suction side and the end plate, which creates a V-separation and is decreasing the effective wing surface. In other words, this feature makes the rear wing more efficient. We can also see a flat main plane pressure side, which means a bit less support for the flap. Another interesting feature of the car is the double roof scoop. The door has a pretty high reaching split line to improve access with a helmet. And at the same time they wanted the scoop to be as far forward as possible. But the engine is turbocharged like the Toyota and also has the same capacity of 3.5 liter. So they needed a bigger intake than just the narrow center scoop. So the solution seems to be to create two additional intakes a little further back. While it's good to have one part of the intake further forward, one of the outboard ones could be obstructed by the center intake while turning. Also, the two intakes either side will get some boundary layer of the surface in front of them. If we look at the Toyota, they used one large roof scoop further back and to make sure to keep high pressure in front of the inlet, they added these fences either side. Also, compared to other scoops, the Lickenhaus has a pretty small leading edge, which will make it more sensitive for angle changes. A nice little detail of the 007 is that the cockpit outlet is also the door handle. If we look at the side pod, we note that it's very wide and high compared to Toyota and Bicolors. And if we look at their pictures from assembly, we can see why. They have a standing rectangular radiator pretty far forward in the side pod. And this design reminded me of pre-2011 Formula 1 cars. From 2011 onwards, Formula 1 teams changed to lying radiators with a bespoke shape, which enabled more extreme undercut designs to bring more energy to the back of the car and to create more downforce. But this is an expensive solution, and this is exactly what Toyota did. And it's the reason why they can have such a large undercut. The Lickenhaus, on the other hand, uses an off-the-shelf radiator, which is a lot cheaper. Also, we can see that the side pod inlet of the Lickenhaus is relatively big. Since one body work has to run for the whole season, they need to cover all tracks and all ambient temperatures, and as a small team you want to play it safe. The expansion ratio between the inlet area and the radiator area is relatively small. The Toyota with its small intakes and very large radiator area will have a much bigger ratio, which means that the air inside the duct will slow down a lot more and flows through the radiator slowly, so separations are less likely boundary layers are smaller and the efficiency is better. If we take a closer look at the radiator, we can see the higher sitting intake on the inboard side and the outlet on the lower outboard corner. With this configuration, the hot water goes into the radiator on the shortest way and the cool water exits with a pipe that is running behind the radiator. Hot air is exiting behind the radiator and you heat the pipe with cooler water with the heat you just rejected in the radiator. It's a small detail, but for maximum efficiency you would usually choose the intake to be on the outboard side and the outlet inboard to avoid heating up while crossing over. The hot water in the intake will be hotter than the air exiting the radiator, so it could already be cooled down a bit before entering the radiator, which gives you a bit more cooling. 
And exactly this radiator connection at the lower outboard corner is limiting the undercut of the bodywork. It seems like they tried to open up the outlet a bit to get more air around the side pod. If we compare this to the Toyota and Baikalis, this flow path is pretty obstructed here and there will be less front downforce than the other two. It seems a bit like the priority was the big rear axle inlet to get this coke bottle shape and guide air along the inner side of the rear wheels. Since there is little air coming from the front axle, there is a risk that the front wheel wake could be sucked into the rear intake, which would reduce the diffuser performance. One thing I'm missing is an intercooler. From the turbo outlet positions, we can assume that it will sit in the side pod, but how would it get any air? I cannot imagine that they would position it behind the water radiator where hot air would hit the intercooler and I cannot see any other air intakes, so that will be interesting to see once the assembly progresses. The wind tunnel pictures confirm the renderings, but the rear wing is a bit lower in the tunnel. Also we can see a large diffuser with side expansion, something that the Toyota doesn't have, and large gurney flaps to support the diffuser. If we look under the bodywork, we can see the wishbones are a welded metal construction without aero profiles, and we can see a clutch cooling, which I found interesting. So all in all, we see here a small private team with limited budget building a pretty race car for the highest category in Le Mans, at a time where big manufacturers think about using spec race cars. It's a great project, and I cannot wait to see it running. What about you? Let me know in the comments below.